Let's go back to our God who is born in prayer this morning in what I call the pastoral prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that we have already been able to sing your word. And Lord, as we sung your word, Lord, to be reminded of the truths found in the songs we sang. Lord, to look to you as our hope. Lord, to look to you alone for our confidence. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would continue, Lord, being pointed to these truths this morning, to the one who we have hope in, even in the midst of darkness and opposition and the raging of an enemy. Father, we pray not only for us this morning, but, Lord, we want to pray for other churches Father, this morning we want to pray for Restoration Church in Washington, D.C., and uh, Lord, for uh, their elders as, as they labor to shepherd their flock there. Father, we pray for, for them as, as they sit under the preaching of the word, and Lord, pray, Lord, that your word would go forth and penetrate the hearts of all that are gathered, building up those who are in Christ and calling to repentance those who have yet to believe. God, we pray, Lord, that you would do this at Restoration Church, or our sister church. Father, Lord, we pray, Lord, for uh, Lord, those across the lands, Lord, in particular this morning as, as the Sunday school, adult Sunday school class has already been praying for, Lord, we want to pray for those in the nation of China. Father, Lord, we want to pray, Lord, for those in persecution there. We want to pray for churches there that are forced to meet underground and pray, God, Lord, that you would be exalted on high there amongst these Christians, these brothers and sisters of ours, Lord. May they continue, Lord, to be emboldened as they look to the hope of Jesus. And, Lord, may they go in boldness and declare that hope so that millions of others who have yet to believe may hear the power of the gospel and be saved. God, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the great work that you are already doing there and pray Lord, that you would continue to do far more abundantly than we could ever ask. Father, may you be glorified there. And Father, now for our hearts. Again, Lord, let us set aside every weight of anxiety, Lord, every concern and thought of the day ahead. Lord, help us to just be still and to come under your word. And Lord, may we be moved by it. May you work through us together, Lord, me as preacher, Lord, may you help me to deliver this faithfully and clearly. And Lord, for the congregation, Lord, sitting under it, Lord, may, may they come under your word, under its authority, and be transformed by the power of your word, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we ask and we pray these things in the name of Christ our King. Amen. Amen. You'll remember some weeks ago when we went through James that I said uh, in talking about plans that we must hold them loosely. We must hold them loosely whether it's the planning of songs and having to adjust one last minute uh, because the one to play the piano can be here due to sickness in our house this morning or whether it's even a title of a sermon that I thought I had coming into this or even the introduction. Hold those plans loosely because it may change as the morning goes. I had planned to start in talking about the Avengers and catching up and needing to catch up before we saw the final movie. But I think there's something more we need to, to be drawn in by this morning. And that is in the fact of even thinking off of what Jim was talking about in George Bailey in that moment of darkness. In the midst, when darkness consumes and there seems to be little light, how do we have hope? How do we have hope in the midst of when everything seems stacked against? How do we have hope in the midst of that? That's what our text this morning from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23 is all about. If you have a Bible, I invite you to, to turn with me there to Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. If you have a Red Pew Bible, you can find that on page number 96. That is the Bible there in front of you. While you're turning there, uh, 
We, we have been working our way through this Gospel of Matthew for, for the last several weeks with a, a couple weeks break in there. We have been working to see who is this Jesus who is being declared. He has been declared the son of David, the son of Abraham. He has been declared the one who is to save his people from his sins. And then we come to our passage last week which I'm actually going to wait and we're going to reread this morning because I want us to catch the fullness of what is going on in chapter 2. And it sets the scene more clearly for what we're going to unfold this morning. So, in light of finally having to, gotten to listen to one of our brother's sermons, I want to ask us this morning to actually stand for the reading of this word so that we can stand under its authority. Hear the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came. They came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and asserted, ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all the region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. So that what was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. You may be seated. This is the word of the Lord. The reason we read Matthew 2 as a whole together is because it paints the picture. It may, paints the picture of a great war that has gone on, that has began long before. A war between Satan and God. And it's continuing here in Matthew chapter 2. We see this war in either refusing to worship this king or to worship him. 
This is the great battle that we are all living in the midst of. Will we worship this king of the Jews? The one who is born, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the one who has come to save the people from their sins. All throughout uh, uh, Matthew chapter 2, we see signs pointing us to the book of Exodus that here is one who has come to bring about a new Exodus. In fact, Jesus is, is painted here as a new Israel, as a new Moses, as a new son. That's the picture, the grand picture we see, but in the, it's in the midst of darkness and gloom. So what in the world, how in the world do we wrestle to understand Matthew 2? What, what is kind of the overarching point of Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23? And I must confess it was not easy to discern. I think I changed this main idea three or four times over the last three days. In wrestling, what is the overarching main idea? Yes, Jesus has come to fulfill. Yes, Jesus is the true and better son. He's the true and better Israel. By the way, there's a great song on that. The true Christ, the true and better by City of Light. It, or no, by uh, Matt Boswell. Really good painting that picture. That almost influenced, but I don't think that's the... The main idea, while it's part of it, and we're going to talk about that, here's what I think is the main idea that Matthew chapter 2 wants us to see. Here's the main idea, and it's coming on the screen. The enemy's rage endures, but the Lord defeats him at every turn. Can you repeat that? The enemy's rage endures, but the Lord defeats him at every turn. We're going to unfold this in the three scenes that come from this chapter or this section of text. For point number one, the flight to Egypt, covering verses 13 through 15. That's the first scene. The second scene and second point is the slaughter in Bethlehem, verses 16 to 18. We're going to see this come out there. And then the third point in the third scene, the return to Nazareth, verses 19 through 23. So let's look at the first point, the flight to Egypt. Verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to, or sorry, I'm looking at the wrong chapter. Verse 13 of chapter 2. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Remember back up in, in verse 2 and, and 3, in Herod hearing that one had been born king of the Jews, that the Magi sought to worship, Herod and all of Jerusalem with him was troubled. And his troubled heart does not find ease at any point. In fact, it probably increases in trouble as he hears from the chief priests and the scribes that this one was predicted to be born in Bethlehem, and now he's come. Herod's heart all the more is filled with rage and malice against this child. He, like the serpent of old, seeks to strike the heel of this child, of this seed, of the woman. He seeks to strike him and find him in order to destroy him. And yet, again, this is what's been going on all throughout history. Since Satan whispered a lie in the garden to Eve of, did God really say? Did he really say? This pursuit of striking down God's plans has been ongoing from the moment Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden and thrust out of Eden of walking with God. Satan has found ways to oppose God's plan and now he does so through Herod. And yet, what happens? Not that his Herod's plans uh, thrive, but they fail. You can look there at verse 13. An angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. God intervenes through his angel in 
casting the son and his mother and Joseph out of the land of Israel and into Egypt to find refuge. God sees to it that he cares for his son. He even tells Joseph, here's exactly why I'm telling you to go to Egypt. It's not that I'm unable, but here Herod is about to pursue this child, to destroy this child, so that you may find refuge. Flee in this moment. Listen. Friends, it's important for us to, to realize this, that there are times that God may call us to flee, and there are times that God may call us to stay. The safest place, though, is in his will, in his purposes. That is where we need to find our safety. Uh, Corey Ten Boom uh, is, is the author of uh, The Hiding Place, which is an autobiography of retelling her account of what it was like to hide Jews from Nazi Germany as they invaded Switzerland. She writes, there are no ifs in God's world. And no places that are safer than other places. The center of his will is our only safety. Let us pray that we may always know. The safest place is in the center of God's will. So if God tells us to flee, we flee. If he tells us to stay in the midst of opposition, we stay. For Joseph, for Jesus as a baby, and for Mary, the call was to flee, and so they fled. Joseph is immediately obedient. Verse 14. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. Joseph did not even wait until the morning sun rose. He went in the darkness of night to flee in immediate obedience to God and his instruction to flee for refuge. He knew that if God tells him he would go. And he listened and went they go and they find refuge. They remain in Egypt until the Lord speaks again, trusting on the Lord and his timing. Brothers and sisters, this is again a reminder for us to listen carefully to God and his careful instructions to us because he is caring for our ultimate good. Even when we are confused or would think, I, my time would be different, let us wait upon the Lord. But why? What is going on? Why this fleeing to Egypt? God, you are the sovereign one. Couldn't you just thwart Herod? Couldn't you just destroy him in a moment? Why send him? Why cause him to flee? Because something bigger is here. Verse 15. And remain there, there in Egypt, until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Brothers and sisters, this is a direct quote from Hosea 11. 1. Hosea 11. 1. Again, it's here on the screen so you can compare. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Out of Egypt I called my son. Now Matthew knows this is not directly speaking here of Jesus. In fact, this is not even a, a normal prophecy which is saying, this will happen. It's a statement, a, a historic narrative statement of something that has already been done for a unique purpose. The context of Hosea is not a context of encouragement per se. In fact, it's a rebuttal against Israel, the ones who were called out of Egypt. Listen to, to some of these things that come here from, uh, oops, come from Hosea 11. In the fact here that as the people were called out of Egypt in the first exodus, the people began to immediately grumble in the wilderness journey. Before they ever reached Mount Sinai to receive God's instructions, they began to grumble and complain, questioning God's provision. While Moses is up on the mountain receiving the law and instruction, they build a golden calf and begin to fall and worship this false idol. 
Hosea 11 is telling us that this people continues. The more God calls them, the more they harden their hearts and turn from him. The more they set their hearts to turn away from God. Verse 7. My people are bent on turning away from me. And though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. Israel, being called out of Egypt, had failed. They failed to honor the God who delivered them. They failed to honor and worship the God who sent the ten plagues upon the nation of Egypt. He, they failed to honor the God who parted the Red Sea so that they could cross safely to the other side on dry ground and then crash those same waters back upon the Egyptians in pursuit. They failed to worship this God. They turned from this God in sin. And this is why they're in the predicament they were in when Hosea writes, because they're in exile. And yet, and yet in the midst of this, Matthew points us to this to say, here is one who has come. In the midst of darkness, in the midst of this plot of one to destroy, just like Pharaoh sought to destroy Israel in Egypt, as Herod now seeks to destroy this king, a new exodus has begun. A new promise of deliverance is here. So I send my son into Egypt to find exile so that I may call him out and sing him that I am the sovereign God over every aspect who promises and guarantees my deliverance of a people. You may think I failed in the first exodus. Here's a better one. Here's a better exodus that's coming because not in, in the first exodus, it was the promise of a land of milk and honey. In the new exodus, something greater is promised, and that is that of life. In the first exodus, it's the people that come out. In the second, it is the king who comes out, and all who identify with him come out with him and what he endures, what he has accomplished. So that there is no room for God. Brothers and sisters, this is the new exodus that is promised in the midst of a pursuit of death. Jesus is the new and better Israel. He's the new and better Moses who leads a people out. He is the true and better son who is called out of Egypt. And Christian, in Jesus, we are guaranteed that we are called out with him in that exodus. We will but trust in him and continue hoping in him. Though there may be enemies that rage against and in pursuit, we know the end of the story. God has promised a deliverance for us in Christ, in this new and better exodus. This is the hope that is shining through in this first scene. As Jesus is called into exile in Egypt, he is called out, bringing us the hope and the assurance of a deliverance to come. Point number two, scene two, the slaughter in Bethlehem. Verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem, and all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Herod, in his malice here, he wanted to leave no chance of this baby being survival. So what does he do? He instructs an unknown person or an unnamed group to go and to seek, to find this infant and to kill him. And to ensure it happens, he instructs them not to just find this one particular, that any male child two years and under in all Bethlehem and all the surrounding region kill him, slaughter him. This is his marching orders and they go. They seek to do this and they do. In the midst of the Savior's birth, in the midst of his being called into exile, murder, slaughter happens of those two and under. 
of these innocent children who are image bearers of Almighty God. They are slaughtered. So what hope does this Savior bring? God, surely you have failed. Surely your plan to save a people, you have brought harm on the people. That would be the temptation. It would be the temptation for us as readers even to say, wait a minute, you're to save your people and yet death comes. Death is coming. How can this be that salvation has come for this one Jesus when death immediately follows his birth? So Matthew rightly says here in verses 17 and 18, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. This time, Matthew points us back to Jeremiah 31, verse 15. He points us here to this in the sense of showing us the great onslaughter of what Herod has done in the killing of these children. Now, it may be as few as 20 children that were killed, and yet it is still such a tragic lamentation and wailing. Matthew rightly is, is pointing this out, that it is a tragic event. He's not trying to undermine the tragedy and the sorrow of the weeping here. But he is doing something more to bring hope into it. But before we turn there, we need to, to see the great lengths that those that stand against God will go to. The great prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, writes it like this. He says, men will do anything to be rid of Jesus. They care not how many children or men or women are destroyed so that they can but resist his kingdom. This is a great reminder of the hostility that comes against God and his kingdom, against his king and his king's people. This is the reality in which we live in. And yet, here, as Matthew points us to Jeremiah 31, his aim is to bring hope and comfort in the midst of this. He aims to bring hope because, friend, what is around Jeremiah 31, 15? It's not just the fact that here in the midst of Jeremiah 31, 15 saying this, Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. The Lord points us to this. Of Rachel from her grave is crying out for her lost children in their exile because of the grievousness of what is happening to them. She cries from the grave for them, refusing to be comforted. And yet, what surrounds this in Jeremiah is not a, a lamentation prophecy. What comes before and after is a call to not a call that God will turn his people's mourning to rejoicing. A call, in fact, for them to not have their eyes filled with tears or their voices heard of weeping. This is what Jeremiah 31 is paying. And guess what? Something even greater than that comes. Comfort comes, but the promise of a new covenant of God not going to forsake his people. In fact, instead of them being able to rebel, he's going to take his law and write it on their hearts. He's going to engrave it upon them. This is the promise that is being made in Jeremiah 31. So as Matthew quotes Jeremiah 31, 15, he's saying, look, as grievous as this is, as saddening and brutal as this is, comfort has now come in this child, in this Jesus. Yes, we grieve because of the loss of lives, no matter how few or how great. And yet, we can do so with hope. We can do so knowing that we have the comfort and the promise of one who has come to overturn the curse of sin and death. The one who brings comfort in the midst of mourning. That's what this Jesus does. And this is why Matthew 
points us to this prophecy from Jeremiah 31, saying that it is fulfilled. Yes, the weeping has gone out, but now the comfort comes. In Jesus coming, in him being called out of Egypt, in the slaughter, he is the one now to bring comfort in the midst of your despair. Christian, church, many of you right now are in the midst of hard circumstances. Whether it's loved ones facing terminal illnesses, whether it's hardships financially, whether it's whatever the case, there's hope in the midst of it. There's hope because Jesus comes to comfort us. He doesn't come to, to take away our circumstances in the year, and now he comes to comfort us by pointing us to what is to come, a better hope, a lasting hope, a hope in the end. Because he's the one who comes to save his people from their sins. He's the one who comes as the king to lead us to a new and better land. One where death reigns no more. Where every tear is wiped away in hell. This is why Jesus fulfills his prophecy. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, Jesus comes to breathe hope. But it's not in the way we would think. Here's what we need to see here. In the midst of all of this, let me go backwards to this one by Daniel Duran. He writes, Matthew would have us understand that God yet loves the people of Bethlehem and will restore them and all who likewise suffer, even as he restored Israel after the exile. Calvin here also adds, as Jeremiah promises a restoration where a nation has been cut off down to their little children, so Matthew reminds his readers that this massacre would not prevent Christ from appearing shortly afterwards as the Redeemer of the whole nation. Brothers and sisters, as Herod tries to wipe out the king, hope and comfort come through Jesus, even in the midst of despair and lamenting. But it comes in a unique way. And this is where we turn in our third scene, point number three, verses 19 and 20. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. Just to make a, a quick point here, I, I want to use a quote by J.C. Ryle here. The rulers of millions have no power to hold on to life when the hour of their departure comes. The murderer of helpless infants must himself die. Herod sought to wreak havoc on Jesus to stomp him out as an infant, and yet Herod's death comes. His, his havoc is unleashed for a short time. The death is certain for him, as is the case for every vile and evil ruler who opposes God and his kingdom. They may wreak havoc for some period, that they too will meet death and their end will come. God's plans are carrying on despite these rulers. Let that be of comfort to us. King Jesus' kingdom will be established. It's going to be established as we will see here through, through this unlikely means. Because as they return, something happens. Verse 21. And he arose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. Verse 22. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. It is said here of, of this son Archelaus that he was only given a third of his father's kingdom because his other two brothers were given the other two-thirds. And yet, this Archelaus was the one most unstable, like his father Herod, that he was a short-tempered man who was quickly unsettled by a troubled heart. And therefore, Joseph was right to fear and then was affirmed in his fear to not go into Bethlehem, to not go into the heart of Judea, but to go aside to Galilee. About Galilee, verse 23. He went and lived in a city called Nazareth, 
so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. That he would be called a Nazarene. Joseph here is instructed to go to Galilee, and they go and settle in this little town called Nazareth, this supposed city. It's probably as small or smaller than our town here of Land O'Lakes, believe it or not. While well, the world may come to vacation here to other parts of the world, even such as myself, I could have not told you where Land O'Lakes or the Northwoods was until I met Darcy. <laughs> Sorry to bust anyone's bubbles, but you're not on the center of everyone's world. But I say that not to shame us, but to, to apply the significance of what it means to be called a Nazarene. A Nazarene. Guess what? When Matthew writes here, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Guess what? The word Nazareth or Nazarene is absent from the Old Testament. In 39 books of the Old Testament Bible, the, the canon of Scripture in Matthew's day, there is not one mention of Nazareth or of a Nazarene. Matthew, have you lost your marbles, dude? Have you lost your marbles? Are you making stuff up to make something fit? No. Matthew is strategic here as an evangelist, as one who is working for the apologetics of our hearts. He's showing us here that Jesus is called to be one from the unnamed, from the smallest of places, from the most unlikely if he would have gone back to Bethlehem in the land of Judea, ties to him being the son of David would have ran supreme. People would have elevated him more than they did in his ministry and thought him as the likely Messiah. But that's not who God promised his Messiah to be. He promised that he would be a lowly and gentle character. That he would be one who is despised and rejected. Friends, why does it say, Matthew, right here, that he would be called a Nazarene to fulfill what was written by the prophets? Because it's wanting us to tie Isaiah 53 in. That this is the one who has come, who would be despised and rejected, who would be stricken, smitten, and afflicted, who would be led to slaughter and remain silent. This Jesus was one of a lowly nature who comes not to win people and to save people by the sword, but by laying down his life, receiving nails through his arms and feet, pierced to a cross of blood, hung in shame in the most cruel and vilest of deaths on a cross. This is how Jesus comes to save the people for himself, by laying down his life. Life, that all who trust in him may have this eternal life. He dies so that we can live. He lowers and humbles himself so that we can be exalted with him in glory. This is the ultimate victory that Jesus has come. He's the one who, catch this, from Genesis 3.15, his heel is stricken on the cross. And yet, as he dies, as he is buried and laid there for three days, rises again and crushes the head of the serpent. Yeah. This is the Jesus who comes to bring ultimate victory and ultimate salvation against the accuser. He wins on the cross. For those three days, those Judeans, those Israelites who put him to death, the Romans, and even Satan himself, are standing thinking we've won. And yet in his rising, he guarantees their defeat. This is what Matthew 2 is trying to teach us. In the midst of all this darkness, in the midst of all the grimness, comes a light of hope. A hope that is guaranteed by the death and resurrection of this Jesus. That he certainly has come to save his people from their sins. Christian, this is the hope we have. And friend, if you are one here who is yet to believe in Jesus, 
This is the whole being extended to you. Jesus is calling for you to see that he is the Savior. He guarantees victory, and he's the only one. So friend, if this is you this morning who has come in here and not believing and stood hostile like Herod against this king, turn from your sin and your allegiance to it and turn and place it in Jesus. Make him your king and follow him because he promises to lead out of exile in the new exodus in finding life in him. But there's one more place we must turn in here. As Matthew 2 has pointed us backwards, we also need to see that there's something pointing us forward here that gives us even more confidence of what I have already said, of Jesus guaranteeing this victory. Matthew 2 points us back to Jeremiah 31 and Hosea 11, but it points us forward to the book of Revelation in chapter 12. Sorry. Here's what I want us to see from Revelation. Uh, I don't know I did not put it in. Sorry. Anyways, I want us to see this from Revelation chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. His tail swept down the third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour her. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she, was, she has a place prepared by God, and when she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Revelation 12, 4 through 6 here begins to pull back the curtain for us to see this ongoing raging war from Satan. Notice, notice there where it says in verse 4 that, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Is this not what Herod sought to do in the killing of this king to devour him as an infant? He's the instrument of Satan here trying to rage war against God's king, against his plan to redeem a people. And yet this child is given birth. It's called to rule over the nations with iron and is called up to God and his throne. Jesus and his raising did not stay on earth, but he ascended after 40 days. He ascended and called up to the throne of God and is seated next to the Father right now, interceding on our behalf and ruling on his throne. And yet now here the, the Lord has promised that the woman was to live and have a place prepared to nourish her, to care for her. God is, is caring for his people through the local church and encouraging and building one another up to stand firm in the days of opposition. But there's more here. And this is where I have in Revelation 12, 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. This is exactly what Satan is doing. He's pursuing the bride of Christ, the church, and seeking to, to oppose them, to stand against. And yet, here's what he goes on to say. Revelation 12, 14 through 17. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent in the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and a times and a half time. The serpent poured water out like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to help to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river, and the dragon had poured from his mouth. Verse 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Satan right now wages war against God's church. And yet, and yet, Christian, in the midst of times when it seems dark, when it seems that we are filled and up against darkness, yes, that great enemy whose rage is raging, sticking his guarantee. 
Revelation goes on in the 18th through 20th chapters and tells us of his certain doom. His doom is sure. We stand with a Savior who has already crushed his head and already guarantees us victory. He's already guaranteed us that there is a new exodus, a new way of deliverance from the bondage of sin and death, and it is through him that he brings comfort to those who need comforting. He brings hope to the hopeless. This Jesus is the one who comes to fulfill everything written on him. And he will defeat Satan at every turn. We're going to see this as we continue going through the book of Matthew. In chapter 4, in a couple weeks, we're going to see the temptations. Jesus succeeds where Adam couldn't. Jesus rises again, defeating death like no other. He's the one who can work to and I hope you can. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus is the one we set our hope upon. Lord, we pray this morning, Lord, that we will look to him and him alone for hope. That, Lord, in the midst of darkness around, in the midst of oppositions, in the midst of whatever is, is battling for our minds and our legions, our attention, Lord, that we would see that you have made promises of hope. They may not come in this life. In fact, for most of us, they won't. And yet we have a living hope, a hope in Christ, a hope in new life, a life where death no more reigns, where no more tears are shed. But Lord, we are with you in paradise, where we are with you in the new and better Jerusalem, a kingdom in which there is plentiful of bread and honey to satisfy all of our cravings. God, we can do so in a way that brings honor and glory to you. Father, we pray this morning, Lord, though, for any here who have been resistant to your will and to your um, worship. God, we pray, Lord, that they would turn their hearts and believe. We pray, Lord, for those in sin, Lord, that they would stop dead in their tracks, knowing that their defeat is as sure as Satan's, unless they turn and repent. God, we pray, Lord, that you would give them the heart to do so. In Christ's name we pray.